May your unfailing love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I will answer the one who taunts me. For I trust in your word. Do not snatch the word from the tr of your truth from my mouth. For I have put my whole in your <coughs> hope in your law. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom for I have thought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame. For I delight in your commands because I love them. I lift up my hands to your commands when I love and which I love and I meditate on your decrees. So be it. Am I on? There we go. How's that? So I watched a little bit of television last night just for a few minutes. My wife was watching SVU, Special Victims Unit, if you've ever seen that. And it just reminded me of how much we fight a spiritual battle with all the things that are on television. And, you know, they get worse and worse all the time. And the guy was so mad about crime and stuff in this world, and, and so he lashed out at God, and he said, what kind of God would suffer little children to come unto Him? And I thought to myself, how they twist Scripture and don't even understand. Because that verse is from where we've talked about before, and we'll talk about again, when we talked about the young rich ruler getting into heaven and everything, but it says in the NIV... Let the little children come to me. The, the, the word in the original means not to hinder is what the suffering means. But they said that and then there was no explanation further or anything. Just how could a God allow all this suffering and especially want suffering to be to little children? Well, I'm here to tell you that Jesus loves the little children. And I'm here to say a praise first for Awanas and having as many children as we have come to that. I said that it was more than what we had last Sunday morning. That is a great thing. I don't have any problem if it's more than what we had here on Sunday morning. I praise God for it. Because you guys have stepped out in faith to serve. And God is faithful. And He has brought those kids in. And like Mike said earlier, we know there are other children that aren't here yet. So we can easily exceed 50 or more here in the next coming weeks. That is nothing but an amazing, amazing God. So I want to start out praising Him as we seek His Word. Father, we do thank You for Your faithfulness. And Lord, help us to realize that You are a God that is big enough. You are a God that cares. You are also a God that will judge. But it is not Your will that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life. And not just eternal life in heaven, but life now. As Jesus came and said that He gave up His life so that we might have life and have abundant life. Fathers, we seek out Your Scriptures today, Lord. I just thank You that Your Word does stand the test of time. That Your Word is living and sharper than any two-edged sword. And that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness. We just thank you and praise you that we have freedom, especially on this Freedom Sunday, to come and worship you. And I thank you for your obedient servants who have given up their freedoms to serve you to find out there is more freedom in Christ than they could ever imagine. As we seek your word today, Lord, fill us with your spirit, guide and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to mention to you that there are opportunities to serve in Awanas too. 
and there are opportunities to serve on our children in Sunday also. If you hadn't noticed, there are more and more children. Praise God again. So it was brought to my attention before, and I changed the bulletin, that it had children's churches are for certain, certain ages. It's not there anymore on the bulletin if you happen to see that. Because children's church is for any child. If we don't have enough teachers, then we'll get teachers, right? I'm sure someone will volunteer. If you notice, Sherry's not in here now because she said, I want to be in the nursery each day so that Joy can come out here, so that Michaela can come out here, so that Savannah can come out here. So she's dedicated herself into the nursery. And if Rona needs more help, she will ask. And I'm sure also that you guys will be willing to help. Because this church has a servant's heart, and I praise God for being able to be a part of it. So October may be Pastor Appreciation Month, and we're going to do it in October instead of November, right, Mike? Because Debbie's on the ball. <laughs> but I appreciate you guys just as much every single day. I also want to remind you, because Barry said something to me this morning that said, like, this is what it's all about. He said... There's Bibles back in the back cubbyhole back there for Awanas. There's a pink Bible for, for girls and a gray Bible for boys. They're in the International Children's Bible version, so they're easier to read and comprehend. And he said, I got to give out a Bible last week at Awanas to a child who never has had one. There's, that is so great. I don't know what's going to happen, but I can just imagine in my mind when... Barry gets to heaven and that little child comes up holding that Bible. I mean, the things that we do on this earth like that are priceless. But we have to give up a little bit of time, don't we? We have to give up a little of the things that we choose to do ourselves, the selfishness, and take ourselves off the throne so that Christ can be on the throne, so that we can glorify God our Father. So I want to remind you that those Bibles are back there. I want to remind you to serve. Also, today is Fifth Sunday. So on fifth Sunday, if you give any offerings during um, Sunday school, it will go to Oana's to help promote that. And with more workers, we do have more expenses and background checks. With more students, we are getting in uh, students that pay enrollment, but we also have some students that need to be sponsored and stuff. So we still need the funding. God has provided. He provided amazingly this summer in getting us the money that we needed to start off the Oana's program. Because again, it's God's ministry with us being the hands and feet of Jesus as long as we remember that. God's timing is perfect. He is supreme. He reigns supreme and nothing will stand in His way. And He is a God that can split time and space and everything and loves you enough that He would give His one and only Son for you. Today is Freedom Sunday. We take that for granted in this country. Because we have freedom. Maybe if you've served in military, you, you understand a little bit more, especially if you served abroad and stuff. But we live in an unprecedented age of freedom in this country. And we also live in an unprecedented day where we take it for granted. And how much more as children of God do we need to consider our freedoms that we have? Because just like with a child... This child that has more, you expect that child to be more responsible, to care about it more, to not take it for granted. We see our fellow brothers and sisters throughout the world being in persecution and oppression. And yet, we don't proclaim the name of God like we should in our own country because we choose not to, because there's too many things that we want to do that hinder us. So the fact that we can serve in our church and serve in Awanas and serve our community, that's the very least that we should do. That's the first part of the Great Commission. Go into your own town. Then we'll go out further. Then we'll go to the other, other ends of the earth. And today, being Freedom Sunday, you can give if you want to. The Free Methodists do give to a certain uh, set free movement foundation, and I'll tell you more about that in a sec with some statistics. And we'll collect offerings for this this week and next week, and then John will send our offering into the Free Methodists. So if you can give, simply mark it Freedom Sunday and give. If you can't give, you can pray. You can become aware of a lot of the problems out there. And I want to read you some things about freedom right now. 
This is from freetheslaves.net. Slavery is everywhere. There are tens of millions of people trapped in various forms of slavery throughout the world today. Researchers estimate that 40 million are enslaved worldwide, generating 150 billion each year in illicit profit for traffickers. Now, this country has known freedom and has known slavery, and it used to be a big problem, right? It still is a big problem. There are more slaves in the United States than there ever were in the Civil War. You don't see them, it's a hidden thing. You don't know the people that are in bondage and trafficking and don't know that they can get out of it or don't have a way to get out of it. In other countries, they don't even have a clue. They think this is what life is supposed to be like, but it's not. All men were created in God's image, regardless of nationality, regardless of gender, anything else, regardless of age. And we need to be aware of the things so that we can at least attack this battle through prayer. Labor for slavery. About 50% toil in forced labor, slavery in industries where manual labor is needed, such as farming, ranching, logging, mining, fishing, brick making, and in service industries working as dishwashers, janitors, gardeners, and maids. Whenever you eat a chocolate candy bar, it was one of the things on the pastor thing is which candy bars, there's a good chance that a slave helped produce that, that cocoa for that uh, chocolate bar. Good chance of it. Now, I'm not saying don't eat chocolate bars or anything else. I'm saying be aware of it. Okay? At least pray for it. In sex slavery, about 12.5% are trapped into forced prostitution sex slavery. Forced marriage slavery, about 37.5% are trapped into forced marriages. And child slavery, about 25% of today's slaves are children. They don't have a chance or future. They're immediately taken out to work somewhere and they think that's the way life is in this cruel world. See, there's a problem in this world and slavery has been around and will be around until the problem's fixed. That problem is sin. And the only answer is Jesus Christ. Slavery is nothing new. It's a hidden crime making it harder for the public to see and harder for slaves to cry out for help. In modern slavery, economics and social forces have enabled its alarming resurgence in the past few decades by increasing pop people's vulnerability. Population. A population explosion has tripled the number of people in the world, mostly in developed countries. In many places, the population has grown faster than the economy, leaving many people economically vulnerable. A fire, flood, drought, or medical emergency places, places them in the hands of ruthless money lenders who enslave them. Migration. Millions are on the move from impoverished rural areas to cities and from poorer countries to wealthier ones in search of work. Traffickers are able to trick them by posing as legitimate labor recruiters. Migrants are especially vulnerable. They are often very far from home, don't speak the local language, have no funds to return home, and no friends or family to rely on. Corruption. Global government corruption often allows slavery to go unpunished. Many law enforcement officials aren't even aware that bonded, la that bonded labor where someone is enslaved to work off a loan is illegal. In many places, those in slavery have no police protection from predatory traffickers and discrimination. Social inequality creates widespread economic and social vulnerability based on factors such as gender, race, tribe, or caste. Modern slaves are cheap and disposable. New slavery has two characteristics that we've not seen before. It's cheap and disposable. Slaves today are cheaper than ever. In 1850, the average slave in the American South cost the equivalent of $40,000 in today's money. Today, you can buy a slave for the amount of money that you would spend going out to dinner and a movie with your wife. A hundred or so, or so dollars can buy a slave in different parts of the world. We live in a problem where sin is rampant and we need a savior. And then we see the things on TV that we do and we see a verse corrupted saying, why would God be a God of suffering? when he says, instead, don't hinder those children to come to me. 
if we have children in here coming out the ears, then we'll make another nursery. We'll do whatever. We won't let them hinder this service. And if a baby cries out, right, perfect timing, it's not going to bother me. I'm going to preach on, don't you worry. <laughs> Modern slaves are not considered investments worth maintaining. In the 19th century, it was difficult to capture slaves and transport them to the United States. But today, when someone is in slavery, gets sick or injured, they are simply dumped, disposed of, or killed. You are connected to slavery, and you can cure it. Slavery flows into our homes, offices, and schools through many of the products we buy. Slaves harvesting cocoa in West Africa ends up in our chocolate. Slaves making charcoal in, Bra in Brazil, which is used to to run smelters that make steel for our cars. Many food products and raw materials are tainted by slavery, such as tomatoes, tuna, shrimp, cotton, diamonds, iron, sugar, and gold. We all have a role to play in bringing slavery to an end. Although there are more people in slavery today than ever before, slavery represents the smallest percentage of the world's population than any other time in history. The Free Methodist Church, every year, spends one Sunday designated to this awareness now they don't spend one Sunday doing something about this that's one of the big things of the issues of free Methodists is remembering the freedom that we have so that we can help others receive their freedom so far to date somewhere around I want to say a million dollars has been donated from the free Methodists Church USA to help slavery I may be wrong on those figures so what is freedom we talked about it today in Psalms 119. The King James Version uses the word liberty instead of freedom because those go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And to have freedom or liberty, don't be ignorant to this, you have to have a governing authority. You have to submit to someone. Jesus said that you will serve one or the other. Which one will you serve? He also said there's no middle ground. If you're not with him, you're against him. If you're not gathering in the harvest, then you're dispersing it. You will, in your freedom, the fact you have freedom, you will be obedient and a servant to someone. Could you imagine the freedom that you have in this country if there weren't laws and regulations that you needed to follow? It would be no freedom whatsoever, would it? If anybody were free to do anything and everything they wanted, then slavery would be rampant. We have to obey someone. So will you obey God's commands? Or will you obey the ruler of this world who has no authority? Because Jesus Christ himself came and took that authority away when he went to the cross for us. The word freedom is only used one time in the King James Version of the Old Testament. It's found in Leviticus 19.20 when it talks about not giving freedom or liberty to a certain individual. It's the only time it's mentioned. Liberty from slavery or bondage. The word, is found, the word free is found 17 times. It starts in Exodus 21. That's right after Exodus 20, right? Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments, right? So Exodus 21 starts out with rules and regulations for Hebrew slaves. The very next chapter that you see talks about Hebrew slaves and the laws that must be there for them. Not slaves from other lands, but Hebrew slaves. Slavery is not something that is a new concept. It is a concept that has been with us. And Jesus himself did not teach the abolishment of slavery. Paul said, if you are a slave, if you can gain your freedom, do it. But if you can't, remember to honor the one who you are enslaved to, God. Because by your obedience, by the morality that you do, that you will glorify. Oh, there's a verse for that, isn't there? Let your light so shine before men, even in slavery that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So even in slavery, we can glorify God. <clears throat> 
Slavery is a result of man sinning against God and tainting his creation. God never intended slavery. He created all men and women, child, race, in his image so that they could freely, get the word, worship him. But see, we have a choice of which authority we're going to obey or not, which one we will serve. So slavery is not a bad thing, and don't throw stones at me. Hear me out about it. It has become a bad thing because of sinful man. Some people in the Old Testament sold themselves out to slavery for a reason that they decided. And they even decided to stay in slavery. Because slavery, if it's done right, may not be a bad thing. But in today, because of greed... The love of money is the root of all evil because of power over other men, because of discriminating factors on the least of these. Slavery is atrocious and something that we need to be aware of. In Exodus 21, here's what it says starting in verse 2. If you buy a Hebrew servant, and that word is synonymous with slave, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year he shall go free. There's our first usage of the word free. In the Bible period, first time you hear about being free, it's talking about when a Hebrew slave can be set free. Because for six years, six days you shall labor, but the seventh day and the seventh year in this you'll be set free. Why? Why do we remember the Sabbath to keep it holy? So that we will long for and look for God's rest. The rest that will come in the millennial reign and the rest that will come for all eternity. So we remember it to keep it holy. So God even put laws in place for slaves so that they would be recognized. But let's read on. <clears throat> he shall go free without paying anything. <laughs> Isn't that exactly what we did through Christ? Not by works of righteousness which we have done. For by grace are you saved not through works. Verse 3, if he comes alone, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him because what God has brought together, let no man separate, not even slavery. Now look at verse 4. If his master gives him a wife, because he has a good master, and she bears him sons and daughters, which are a blessing and heritage from the Lord, then the woman and her children shall belong to her master, and only the man shall go free. Whoa, that's a little different, but... If I relate that to a God in heaven, isn't he the one that blessed man with a wife? And the words are gender specific. God did that before sin ever came into the world. And he blessed them and told them to rule over this world and to, to multiply. These are things that happened before mankind ever sinned. These are the blessings from a wonderful master in heaven that we should thank him and love him for. Verse 5, but if the servant declares, I love my master, this is earthly that you're talking about, but points to God so much, and I love my wife and children, and do not want to go free, second time that it's used, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door of the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Body piercing. Ooh, in the Bible. <laughs> to show who he belongs to that that man has decided to belong to his master for life. In the New Testament, we kind of do that when we profess our faith with getting baptized as that outward expression of our inward faith. Then let's see what happens in verse 6. Then is, I mean, uh, excuse me, the rest of it. Then he will be his servant or slave for life. Done deal. So way back, right after the Ten Commandments, God gives commandments for slavery so that it won't be abused because we live in a fallen creation again. We don't see slavery before mankind's fall. We see someone who freely worshiped God. But when we fail, now we've got a choice to make, don't we? Are we going to be a slave to God or are we going to be slave to the devil? There is no in-between. You're either for or you're against. New Testament, in the King James ver Version of the Bible, freedom is found two times. The first is in Acts 22, verse 28. So I'm going to start in verse 24. 
The commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who has not been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. The man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me if you are a Roman citizen. Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. Paul replied, but I was born a citizen. You see the word free or freedom in there anywhere? It's not there in the King James Version. Word's not there, but the root word is. It's called citizen or citizenship. Because in the New Testament, the only way that you have freedom, the only way that you're free, is to be a citizen of another country, heaven. We are aliens and foreigners in this land, and we need to live as so. We, our citizenship, our freedom, belongs in heaven, where our master is God, not the devil, because of his love for us through Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit that Jesus said, it's better for me to go so that the Spirit of God can come upon you. Verse 28, in the King James Version, that was the NIV, the King James Version says, with a great sum I obtained this freedom. And Paul said, but I was free born. And so you can't be free born unless you're born again by the Spirit, can you? Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read through that chapter and just listen and absorb what God's telling you through this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, those who are not citizens. All of us also used to live among them at one time. We gratified the cravings of our flesh and followed its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath from God Almighty. Verse 4, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. Didn't you do those verses this morning, Debbie? Huh. And I didn't tell her to. Good job. <laughs> Verse 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms where our new citizenship belongs. He did that in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work so that you can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works as freed citizens of a new and better place, a place called heaven, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Verse 11, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth called uncertain called uncircumcision by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from the citizenship or the freedom in Israel and foreigners, the exact opposite of citizens, to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in this world. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near to that land as citizens freed from the penalty and the power of sin by the blood of Jesus Christ himself. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside his flesh, the law which it commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in him one new humanity out of the two thus making peace. 
and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we have acts, both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, wrapping this up, if you haven't understood this so far, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but the complete opposite, fellow with one another, citizens in the kingdom of God, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, with all of God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Wow. All this I'm set free to be a slave for God in the kingdom of heaven, knowing where my true home is, who my true master is, but it's still a choice I need to make. A choice I have to make. So what is the opposite of freedom? Many of us live that way sometimes. Paul described it this way, as enemies of the cross. The opposite of freedom is bondage, slavery, and not living as a citizen of heaven. Not living, as John 12 put it, as a ch child of light. That's the opposite of freedom. Sometimes we make the mistake of slavery for freedom simply because we can't see the difference, just like these slaves that don't know it in the rest of the world because they've never seen any difference. We think that because of all this freedom we have, we're free to do nothing for the kingdom. Boy, that's the opposite of the freedom that Christ gave us. We are free to do everything, to use every ability that we have, every fleeting moment, every fleeting breath, to praise God and bring glory and honor to Him. But sometimes we're complacent, content, and just sitting there and being saved, and we know it. Amen? I better not get an amen back to that. But in reality, we're slaves to one master, the one who has no authority in this earth anymore. And Jesus died taking away His authority, bringing victory in Jesus. We love that song, but do we think about what it means? And then Jesus said, I have died not only so that you'll have life, but abundant life. Here are those words from John 10, starting verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, abundant life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd is the one who lays down his life for his sheep. Luke chapter 15 is one I've preached on before and I'll preach on again. It tells us more about freedom. You might know it as the parable of the prodigal son, but... I've said it before and I'm going to say it again right now. It was the prodigal father. Because prodigal means excessive, extravagant, even to the point of wasteful. Because why would a loving God not send somebody to hell? Why would a loving God give his son up so that you can live? Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? How about looking at it this way? Because the Lord is my shepherd, I am in need of nothing. I have everything. Total different, same words, depending on how you view them. The freedom that you have in Christ means that you can do so much for the kingdom of God by the power of Spirit that Jesus would even say greater things you will do. So here's what this says in Luke 15, verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Give me the shares of my estate, of, his, of your estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. He set off for a distant country, a foreign land, a place where he wasn't a citizen, a place where he didn't have freedom. And there, everything seemed great, so he squandered his wealth in wild living. 
After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, the whole land that belonged to this other master, this foreign land. And he began to be in need, to realize he needed a savior, to realize he couldn't save himself. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, a freed person of that country, a representative. One, if that country was all it cracked up to be, ought to take care of him, right? If this is where he's putting his hopes and dreams in this country, and this citizen sent him to the fields to feed pigs instead. Wow. That's the thief that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The man was in such bad shape in verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. Not only did he get such a disgusting, lowly job, but he wanted to eat the pig slop now. Wow, how we think this world is so great in the things of this world when God is crying out, I will give you riches. And Paul says, I wish that you could grasp how high and how uh, deep and how big, I know I'm butchering, the love of God is for you, that you can get this concept, just get a glimpse of it. What did John 10, 10 say? The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But the complete opposite is that is I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, when he found this new birth inside of him, he said, so he didn't just believe, he proclaimed, right? How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. So he did something about it. He set out and went back to his father and said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Hmm. When David was committed with his sin of adultery with Bathsheba, he said, to you, Lord, and only you have I sinned. Because we've got to get this relationship right before we can get these relationships right. Our sin is against God. And He's done everything to get that right by sending His Son to die on the cross for us. <clears throat> I am no longer worthy to be called your Son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father came to him. His father saw him, was filled with compassion, love, mercy, grace. And he ran to his son. Didn't worry about the riches that he had, the power and prestige that he had. He said, ah, I'll lay them all on the cross literally to save you. I'll be silent before the shearers. <clears throat> he threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, my citizenship, my freedom, and against you, the master, the ruler of this kingdom. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, the exact opposite, quick, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead in his transgressions and sin. And now he is alive, born again by the power of God to do good works that glorify his Father in heaven. He was lost. He was that sheep that had wandered off looking for another tuft of grass that he thought was better than where he was at and got lost and separated but now it's found. So they, both of them, began to celebrate. Wow. Philippians chapter 3 is what I want to close with. And for your homework, read all of Philippians chapter 3. I just decided not to. I decided to concentrate on a few verses. Philippians 3, 18 to 20. For I has often told you before and now tell you again. I think I alluded to this earlier. Even with tears, frustration, I don't know what to say. Many live as enemies of the cross. Their destination is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and it's really 
pig slop. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, <laughs> but not yours. Your, your citizenship, our citizenship, our freedom is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, 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 I beg of you, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by God's mercies, to live your life, the one and only life that you have, every second, every thought, every action on how you can bring God glory, the things He's called you to do. And you don't even have to do it. All you have to do is die to yourself and the Spirit will do it. Read Acts and look at the power of the Holy Spirit. And we take and twist Scripture so much for our own religion. And we think, oh, the church that's come about because it followed the lineage of Peter. No. Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And Peter's the one under the power of the Holy Spirit, this fisherman who always took his foot in his mouth, who then got up that day and preached, and by the power of God, the church was born. Hmm, that's what that means. And we're to continue on that, each of us being the hands and feet of Christ. Preaching as though the message of reconciliation was given to us ourselves as ambassadors of this new kingdom. So I beg you to live as freed citizens, freed citizens that you are, slaves for Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we thank you so much for our freedom and we pray for the ones that are persecuted throughout this world. We pray so much for those that don't know Jesus Christ and are suffering in this world. That's the very reason that Jesus came to the least of these. It's not your will that any should perish no matter what their status is as, as far as gender or race or status quo in this world. And Father, help us as freed citizens of the kingdom of heaven to pray, to give, to make this burden one that means something to us because it meant so much to Jesus Christ. Us, for us not to sit by idly as the Pharisees and live, bask in our so-called freedoms, but to live a life that will deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow after Jesus. We thank you that we aren't persecuted to come here and worship you and hear your words, Lord. And we thank you that your word is true, that it will sanctify us and make us whole. And we thank you and praise you that, yes, one day Jesus will return as he has promised and you has promised. And he will take all these sinful things away. He'll wipe every tear from our eye. And we thank you and praise you that your plan is perfect in every way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.